going to look at Oscar Wilde as an Irishman and more specifically then how well embedded he was in the Irish community in London, because London has always been a city that drew interest from Irish people and a lot of Irish people move and live there, as I did myself. And to look at Oscar's life in that context and the life of his family. Um, so firstly, I suppose, and, and if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, to state the obvious, Oscar Wilde was thoroughly Irish. He was as Irish as I am, in fact. He was born, as we know, on the 16th of October, 1854, to Irish parents, William and Jane Wilde, in a well-situated but relatively modest terraced house at 21 Weston Row in Dublin, which is close to Trinity College, uh, if anybody's familiar with Dublin. And now that building, in fact, is part of the university. Um, as a child, he moved with his family to One Merrion Square, a very prominent, imposing and prestigious house that many of you, I'm sure, will have visited at this stage. Aged nine, Oscar joined his brother Willie at Portora Royal School in Enniskillen in the north of the country in County Fermanagh, and he attended school here from 1864 to 1871. And then aged 16, he left Portora with a Royal Scholarship to read classics at Trinity College Dublin, just around the corner from his family home, in fact. And he was a student there from 1871 until 1874. Weeks short of his 20th birthday, Oscar was awarded a demiship to Magdalen College in Oxford, where he read greats from 1874 to 1878. And it was at that point to attend um, university in Oxford that he left Ireland. And while he visited Ireland from time to time during um, his time at university in England and afterwards, he never lived in Ireland again. And in fact, he had very few ties to Ireland after his mother and his brother left the city, uh, left the city of Dublin in 1879. And just to give you a brief note on the status of Ireland at the time, the political status really, from 1801 and the Act of Union until 1922, when she won her independence, Ireland was governed by the Parliament of the United Kingdom in London through their administrative headquarters at Dublin Castle. And there was a very strong link between the, the two countries, and there still is, and many Irish people travelled to live and work in England, and they still do. And in fact, we retain the common travel area, and it remains in place, and it affords Irish people rights to live and work and vote in the UK, and likewise, English people come and live and work here. Um, and, and we value that very highly, I must say. So if we move on to the next slide, um, just to talk a little bit about Oscar, when he had left Dublin, when he had gone to Oxford and when he was an Irishman abroad. And um, he was attracted to London, like many people are, and like I was myself, by the opportunities available there. He was an ambitious young man and he was very determined to get on. And he made it his business to cultivate the good favour of the English public, particularly the upper echelons. So in order to do that, he modified his dress and he modified his behaviour. And it's funny how people remarked very often on his behaviour and his dress and how that changed subtly over time. So you have one Oxford classmate, John Edward Portney Bodley, who's pictured there, you can see the red arrow pointing to him. And he remarked on Wilde's Irishness and he was clearly very familiar with Dublin, this man because he said, he didn't mention Wilde's accent, but he described him as a good-natured, though unsophisticated young Irishman, an unaffected youth, the cut of whose garments, though doubtless counted unexceptional in Dame Street or College Green, had a quaint look for doing the high. Um, that was a comment that he gave to New York Times in 1882. And it's quite a put down, really. It's, it's quite a sneering comment. But it just shows you that Oscar was marked out by his otherness, by his difference very early on, by the fact that he was Irish and recognisably Irish. This, this Irishness was often remarked upon and very often remarked upon favourably. So if you look at an excerpt from the entry on Oscar Wilde in the biography and review of 1880, um, it reads, he, Wilde, is the offspring of a fervid and emotional race and the child of two persons of unusual character. In him, the strong emotional tendency of the Irish nature, which with most of the race feeds personal feeling alone, becomes through intellectual development an ardour for art and its glories. So it's a bit of a stereotype, but really quite a positive description of an Irish person as being very emotional, fervid, creative, um, literary, um, but many of his contemporaries, his Irish contemporaries, remarked upon his Irishness as well, and most notably uh, George Bernard Shaw uh, described him as a root, a very Irish Irishman, and as such a foreigner everywhere but in Ireland. And Grant Allen, 
um, who was also very Celtic in his nature, described Wilde as an Irish man to the core. Now, it's very interesting to look, I think, at Oscar Wilde's accent, because it's, it's often reported that he didn't speak with a particularly distinct Irish accent. And I would argue that there are a whole variety of Irish accents. Um, and he would have grown up in middle class, middle to upper class Dublin. He would have had quite a refined accent anyway. Um, but it's quite interesting, I think, to look at his mother's attitude to the Irish accent. This quote from a letter that she wrote to Oscar is very revealing. She had shortly returned from a trip to Mayo, and she says, the Irish accent is dreadful. I shudder, mourn in paupers, which is morning papers, how refined we are. Willie's is the only refreshing accent I hear. So there may have been a conscious effort on, on the part of the family to lose or to modify or, or to neutralize their accent somewhat. Um, lecturing in America in 1882, Oscar said something quite interesting. He said, I wish I had a good Irish accent to read in but my Irish accent was one of the many things I forgot at Oxford. And that may have been something that this young man, this outsider, did very consciously in order to blend in and find acceptance among his peers. But what's really interesting, I think, is that there's a suggestion that um, when he was speaking another language, when he was speaking French, a language that he was very fluent in, in fact, it was claimed that he spoke French with an Irish accent. So Frank Harris um, observed and if we could move on to the next slide at this point here. Thank you. Uh, Frank Harris um, observes of Oscar that he spoke French with an Irish accent. We have a quote from him there saying, at length Oscar leaned across the table and said to him in French, with strange to say a slight Irish accent, not noticeable when he spoke English. And then you have other um, uh, people saying similar. So Andrei Rafovovich, a close associate of John Gray, the poet John Gray, when referring to the way in which Wilde spoke, described him as very Irish. And there are some other quotes there with Grant Allen, they're talking about how he was Irish to the core. Um, if we move on to the next slide. Um, away then from Oscar's appearance as an Irish man and his voice and, and intonation and, and accent as an Irishman, it's interesting to look at his politics because again what he sought when he moved to England was acceptance and promotion in fact and he wanted to do well and he wanted to, to move easily among the higher echelons of society. So he may have been very obvious initially in his Irish um, manner and appearance. What's very um, difficult to discern sometimes is his view on the very fraught politics of the time and his sympathy for the campaign for some measure of autonomy for Ireland, a campaign that his mother was central to and very closely associated with. So several commentators have suggested that Wilde was acutely aware of the horror, um, particularly of the Irish famine. And that certainly would have been the case because his father, um, when he was compiling the census of Ireland, traveled around the country and observed at first hand the dreadful deprivation, disease and, and awful poverty that had resulted from the famine, and no doubt Oscar would have been privy to tales of such things. Um, and so certain academics would suggest that he must have been acutely aware of this and that it must have informed his writing, his thinking, and his attitude to English politicians. Now, sometimes this is more obvious than, than not. So he felt on safer ground, I think, expressing his political views on Ireland when he was lecturing in, in America, and in Irish America in particular. When he lectured on Irish poetry in San Francisco, um, in April 1882, to an audience sympathetic to the plight of post famine Ireland, he spoke of his peculiar reverence and love, as a quote, for the men of 48, so that's the revolutionary men of 1848, announcing that he was, quote, trained by my mother to love and reverence them as a Catholic child is the saints of the calendar. Yet Wilde was very much his own man. And it's said, as well, that you cannot assume that just because his mother was so politically motivated and so revolutionary in her outlook, that this forms a vital element of the picture of Wilde himself. If we move on to the next slide. So next slide, please, Darcy. So we can see there that it is disputed really as to how much of this post-colonial um, attempt to define Wilde in terms of his politics is relevant because he was a chameleon at heart. He was a wearer of masks and he very often modified his behaviour and his attitudes 
um, depending on the audience he was speaking to. So he can be quite a slippery character and it can be a little bit difficult really to get a handle on what he really thought. But I think that there are some insights. Um, there's a quote here that I've taken from a report in the New Orleans Picayune um, from 1882 when he was traveling in America. And it's quite a measured um, response really to the politics of the age. He says, I do not wish to see the empire dismembered, but only to see the Irish people free and Ireland still a willing and integral part of the British empire. To dismember a great empire in this age of vast armies and overweening ambition on the part of other nations is to consign the peoples of the broken country to weak and insignificant places in the panorama of nations. And that's a very measured, subtle kind of approach, particularly the fact that he, he made it in America. It gives perhaps some insight into um, his thinking. So if we move on to the next slide. Again, we're looking at the public versus private Oscar Wilde and Oscar Wilde as he behaved in the US versus how he behaved in, in the United Kingdom. So undoubtedly when he was in America, he seemed to feel freer to speak out against the British establishment and its treatment of Ireland. And you can see some quotes there taking, taken from um, a speech he gave in Minnesota on St. Patrick's Day, where he talks about um, with the coming of the English, art in Ireland came to an end, for art could not live and flourish under a tyrant. Strong language, but again, very much suited towards the audience that, that he was uh, addressing on the evening. And he speaks um, on a, a huge event of the, of the time, the murder of Lord Frederick Cavendish. And he says, when liberty comes with hands dabbled in blood, it is hard to shake hands with her. But he immediately qualifies this by saying, we forget how much England is to blame. She is reaping the fruit of seven centuries of injustice. So strong language there when he's speaking in America. But then when he's writing poetry and he's writing for an English readership, um, in his poem, The Grave of Keats, he writes, O oh, poet painter of our English land. In Ave Imperatrix, his narrator eulogizes our English chivalry and quiet English fields. But he also laments the price paid by the colonizer, which is quite interesting as well. He talks about um, a price that, that somebody who goes and colonizes another land might ultimately pay for doing so. And those whose, wound, weary, whose wounds are never healed, whose weary race is never won, O Cromwell's England must thou yield for every inch of ground a sun. So hard hitting and, and very interesting insight into his politics. Um, but Wilde was a chameleon and he was a wearer of masks. And it's quite interesting, actually, um, that some of the commentary, like commentary from Declan Kybert, for instance, um, who wrote in Benting Ireland, suggests that by wearing this mask, sometimes he could free himself to become more Irish and more outspoken than perhaps he could have even been back in Ireland. Um, he really was, as Richard Pine says, an outsider of both English and Irish culture. Um, and very often when he was anonymously writing, he was prepared to criticise England's treatment of Ireland as long as he didn't have to put his name to it. So it's quite interesting to see his letter there um, to James Nicol Dunn, which I've, I've taken an excerpt from. And James Nicol Dunn was the managing editor of Henley Scott's Observer and had invited Wilde to contribute. And he said, my dear sir, it will give me great pleasure to write for you. But as I am very busy, I think it would be better not to advertise my name as a contributor. Besides, I hear your paper is anti-home rule and I'm a most recalcitrant patriot. So in some senses, he had to make a living. He made his living by writing and, and by reviewing. He was keen to, to get this opportunity and this job, but he didn't want his name to be associated with a paper that was so clearly an anti-home rule paper at the time. So... Again, uh, another review that he writes there, a Chinese sage and speaker in February of 1890. He writes, uh, were he to come back to earth and visit us, he might have something to say to Mr. Balfour about his coercion and active misgovernment in Ireland. That's the quote in pink there. So quite outspoken when he doesn't have to actually put his own name to the pieces. Um, when it comes to, to politics more specifically, if we move on to the next slide, There was one towering figure um, in Irish politics at the time, and that was Charles Stuart Parnell. Um, and nobody could be unaware of what was happening at the time in London um, with Parnell's rise and then dramatic fall from grace. So while I took a very keen interest in the fate of Charles Stuart Parnell, who was leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party, and the Irish Parliamentary Party was hugely significant at the time because it held the balance of power during the Home Rule debates of 1885 and 86. Wilde attended sessions of the Parnell Commission, 
and his library contained 13 volumes of their proceedings. But it may be, in fact, that his sympathies lay with a man whose private life was being used to depose him. And there are interesting parallels, of course, with Wilde's own life there. And it's quite interesting what he writes in The Soul of Man uh, in 1891, when he criticizes the media in the way that it appears supportive of, in a way that appears to make him supportive of Parnell. So he writes, the harm is done by the serious, thoughtful, earnest journalists who solemnly, as they are doing at present, will drag before the eyes of the public some incident in the private life of a great statesman, of a man who is a leader of political thought as he is a creator of political force, and invite the public to discuss the incident, to exercise authority in the manner to give their views, in fact, to make themselves ridiculous, offensive and harmful. The private lives of men and women should not be told to the public. The public have nothing to do with them at all. And that could have been written yesterday. It could be written tomorrow. It's, it's so incredibly insightful and timeless um, as a commentary on, on public figures and the harm that, that can often be done to them by, um, by negative press or, or by their enemies through such organs. Um, it's interesting to see also that Wilde was quite happy to invoke his Irishness when he felt rejected by the British establishment. And there are several key events in which that's um, obvious. Uh, one of them was when his play, Salome, was rejected, refused a license, or when in De, De Profundus he extended his personal grief into a reflection of the historical when he wrote to Lord Alfred Douglas of the ruin your race has brought on mine. And I think he associated sometimes the idea of being in the Irish minority as being an artist and being misunderstood as an artist. So uh, Patrick M. Horan writes, being in the Irish minority strengthened Wilde's notion that most artists were alienated and unappreciated by the populace. And it fed into this like feeling of, of being um, undervalued and under pressure and, and judged. So if we move on to the next slide, just to broaden things out a little bit beyond the notion of being Irish, just the notion of being Celtic. And Wilde often spoke of his kinship and this great kinship that he felt existed between the people from the Celtic nations. And I, I, you can see them in, in the map there, um, as they, they would have identified themselves. So you've got um, the Cornish people, you've got the Welsh, the Scottish, the Irish, and then there would be certain communities in France as well. And um, he saw them as having a kinship. And in a letter to Grant Allen, whose father was Irish, he suggested, quote, all of us who are Celts, Welsh, Scotch and Irish should inaugurate a Celtic dinner and assert ourselves and show these, these tedious angles or Teutons what a race we are and how proud we are to belong to that race. So if we move on to the next slide, he was very practical in his support of all things Irish and Celtic as well. And nowhere is this more evident than he was editing The Woman's World. He edited the uh, magazine for two full years and he lent very practical support to Irish cottage industries. And he published articles on activities such as lace making and weaving. Um, so there were so many occasions on which he was um, keen to comment on Ireland and comment on the craft work there and comment on the talent of the people involved. Um, and they wouldn't have really had other outlets for, for such praise. So it was really interesting to see. There was actually an Irish exhibition at Olympia at the time, and there was an Irish village there featuring 12 thatched cottages with well-dressed women making Irish lace. So it was a bit of a zeitgeist thing as well. I mean, there was a lot of interest in Irish and some Irish crafts, which he seemed to tap into. So if we move on then to look at... Um, his compatriots, I suppose, and how Irish people were faring in London at the time generally. Um, I've mentioned already that he sometimes felt um, that he could seek refuge in his Irishness when he was rejected. Um, and I think that you need to understand, really, I suppose, um, how he fit in with the community there, who had quite a separate identity and saw themselves as being Irish first and foremost very often. So if we move on... Um, to the next slide, it gives you some idea of the power of the Irish community, very often sort of soft power that Irish people wielded in London. Um, and Roy Foster comments on this, the great historian Roy Foster, where he talks about London, which was a magnet for generations of middle class Irish arrivists determined to make their mark. And he describes this as conquering England, the Ireland in Victorian London. And that was very much the case because I suppose very quickly these men and women who arrived over identified where they could most make their impact. And that would have been most obviously in the media, in the newspaper business, and also in parliament. Um, 
and they gravitated towards both and were very, very successful, in fact, in uh, asserting themselves uh, in both spheres. Um, so if you look at um, a survey that was carried out in 1872, called a survey of the Irish in England by a man called Hugh Heinrich, he reports, quote, there is not a newspaper in London without its one, two, three and four Irish writers and Irish reporters on the staff. Indeed, Irish reporters are not alone numerous, but are the best and ablest who supply the daily papers with the court and parliamentary records of the day. So that's very interesting because he's connecting the media and the newspapers with the parliamentary uh, proceedings. And very um, clear that these Irish men, particularly, but some women also identified these as the, the, keen, the clearest spheres of power. The politics was dominated at the time by the debate on home rule and the Irish questions. And Irish literary groupings and societies were springing up throughout the city. And there were some key Irish figures who interacted with Wilde and they were operating in London at the time in the spheres of politics and the media. And they were car carving out positions of considerable power and influence. So if we look at some of these people um, specifically and we move on to the next slide. Among these um, men who were associated with Wilde at the time, uh, one was Justin McCarthy. Justin McCarthy, like many of his compatriots, had gone into the newspaper business. He was the editor of the Morning Star. He was the leader writer for the Daily News. And he was also a national MP from 1879 to 1900. And he was also a close friend of Bram Stoker, who moved in Wild Circle. And it's interesting um, to take a quote from his own memoir, An Irishman's Story, where he talks about London. And I think that this echoes how a lot of Irish people who moved to London would have felt at the time. London was to me a kind of fairy ground to which my love of English literature drew me with an almost romantic longing. I longed to become familiar with the London of Shakespeare, with the London of Prince Hal and Falstaff, of Addison Spectator, of Byron and Dickens and Thackeray. My brother and I used to rhapsodize to each other about London and a London literary life. And I used to pour out to my sister my dreams of the time when I should be settled in London. So a great fondness and a great respect um, particularly for the literary tradition in London, but also very canny in making his way into the newspaper business and making his way into politics and very definitely making his mark. So um, McCarthy and, and Oscar were connected. And there's a quote there, if you can see it in the box. Um, if Wilde arrived in London as an Oxonian, he came as an Irishman too, and an Irishman aligned like his mother with the ideals of national self-assertion and political liberty. He was recognized as such by others. The designation marked him as an outsider and also set him firmly on one side of the great political fault line that ran through late Victorian society, the question of home rule for Ireland. Nevertheless, there was support to be gleaned from the association Wild hunted up, the capital's expatriate Irish brigade, a heterodox group composed mainly of literary and political types and dominated by the novelist MP and delightful conversationalist Justin McCarthy. So you can see how useful McCarthy was to Wild. But it extended even to the fringes of the Irish aristocracy. The social highlight of Wilde's first London season was the ball he attended given by Lady Olive Guinness at Carlton House Terrace. So he, he was quick to associate himself with the more prominent Irish people who were operating in London at the time as well. And he wrote um, in praise of McCarthy and also in praise of his son. So he talks about Justin McCarthy being a writer of brilliancy and talks about his book, The History of Our Times, um, and he also talked about McCarthy's son and said that he was a son of great promise who may excel in his, uh, his father in brilliancy. And it's interesting that he inscribed a copy of The Happy Prince to this son, to Justin Huntley McCarthy, from his friend Oscar Wilde. And he even composed a poem, an original poem, to go with it, which you can see there in the little yellow box. So fostering these close friendships and close relationships with these very powerful men. And if we move on then to the next slide. But what did McCarthy think of Oscar Wilde? Um, the most obvious um, association that the two men had in literature was when McCarthy edited Irish Literature, which was published in 1904, which was very early on. It was only four years after Oscar's death, and he still would have been a man that was very controversial, a man that people didn't necessarily want to be associated with or didn't want to include in their volumes and their anthologies. 
But McCarthy devoted 19 pages of volume 9 out of 10, and it was arranged in alphabetical order, so he wasn't being pushed to the back, it was because he was wild. And he uh, de devoted these 19 pages to Wilde's writings. He included The Selfish Giant, he included an extract from The Decay of Lying, and he included six poems. And the accompanying biographical note that described Wilde and his life was wholly laudatory. And it talked about how he plunged himself into the vortex of London society, how he was the apostle of culture and how he established himself. It talks then in the, the middle paragraph there about his writing and about how successful he was with his plays. And then it talks about his closing years, dark and sorrowful. Um, he became involved in the meshes of the law, was condemned to a term of imprisonment. So very sympathetic and, and very interesting to see that this was written so early on in 1904. So Grace of War there from McCarthy, although albeit posthumous. Um, if we move on then to the next slide, we see a, an entirely different man, an entirely different attitude towards Wilde. Um, far less sympathetic to Wilde was a man called Thomas Power or T.P. O'Connor. He was a very powerful man with a very similar profile to McCarthy. He moved to London as sub-editor of the Daily Telegraph and he too was elected an MP in 1880, and he contributed a nightly sketch of proceedings to the Pall Mall Gazette during his time in Parliament. And he also founded and was the first editor of The Star in 1887, The Weekly Sun in 1891, and The Sun in 1993, MAP and TP's Weekly in 1902. It's quite interesting then, the, the Weekly Sun really had quite an obsession with Wilde in his career, but a very unhealthy obsession and followed his career with insinuation, curiosity, and a complete lack of sympathy. And it was almost certainly uh, this man O'Connor who wrote that paper's assessment of Salome and said, quote, anything more loathsome and revolting than the atmosphere Mr. Wilde has created in this drama, it would be difficult to imagine. Now, Wilde was very aware of this hostility, and he declared, quote, for some years past, all kinds of scurrilous personal attacks have been made upon me in Mr. O'Connor's newspapers. And most bizarre of all was an accusation of plagiarism, where just to briefly summarise, and, and I've included um, quite a bit of text there, but a poem was written that was purported to have been written by Wilde, which was a parody of his poetry. And then he was accused of plagiarism for writing that poem, even though he never wrote it. And who wrote in to double down on that accusation of plagiarism? Only T.P. O'Connor himself. So very bizarre, I always seem to take every opportunity possible to, to do Oscar down and to attack him um, as much as possible. And it's been speculated, in fact, speculated by Brian Earle, specifically in Oscar and the Irish, in the Dublin Review of Books in January 2013, that O'Connor's dislike of Wilde's persona was perhaps related to elements in his own personality, which he was ill at ease and wished to conceal, and that would be his sexuality, is, is what he's referring to there. Um, so to move on then to the next slide, um, another prominent man, another similar profile. You can see that there's a real pattern emerging here as to how these men conducted themselves. This man, Timothy Michael Healy, was a nationalist politician again. He was a journalist again. He was an author. He was a barrister and a somewhat controversial Irish MP who achieved the Healy Clause in the Land Law Ireland Act of 1881. And that provided that no further rent should in future be charged in town's improvements. And he was also in, in his future life to become the first governor general of the Irish Free State in the 1920s. So very powerful, very prominent, very strongly Irish. He was recognised as a brilliant debater with a keen intellect. And he operated as parliamentary correspondent, just as O'Connor did, for the nation, which is, was owned actually by his uncle. And he wrote numerous articles in support of Parnell. But he turned against him later because of his, what he described as scandalous private life. And when Parnell said, who's the master of the party? Healy said, with quipped eye, but who's the mistress of the party? Um, although Healy didn't know Wilde personally, he greatly admired his parents and his mother in particular. And in fact, in 1895, when Wilde was deeply in trouble, he begged Frank Lockwood, who was the Solicitor General, um, not to proceed with charges against Wilde for a second time. And he really made that plea on behalf of Lady Wilde, of Wilde's mother, because he saw her as, as being a very um, patriotic and sympathetic woman, and he didn't want to see her suffer, to suffer further. And you can see some extracts there from um, Letters and, and Leaders of My Day, a book that he wrote in, in 1928, that deals specifically with the Wilds um, and with his admiration in particular for the Wild parents. So if we move on then to the next slide. Um, 
to move away then from those specific characters and to move into the literary scene and away from the media, the newspaper scene and the political scene. If we look at the literary scene in Ireland, well, it was really fascinating at the time. There was an enormous clash going on between two generations of Irish immigrant writers. And you had a group called, who would have been described as the Anglo-Irish or in that really interesting little graphic there, West British, which is still a term that's used in Ireland, in fact, which is funny. And these were Irish literary migrants to London who relocated for a combination of social, economic and cultural reasons. They had a keen interest in politics always. And although they identified as Irish nationalists, they were very keen to participate in British political and cultural life. And as we can see, they embedded themselves in British political and cultural and media life. And they had a hybrid identity, which they carefully crafted. By the 1880s, these Irish writers were very well established in the sphere of liberal London. And many of them, among them T.P. O'Connor and Justin McCarthy, who we've already spoken about, played a very prominent role in the liberal home rule campaign of 1886 to 1892. They wrote for an English readership, even when they were writing about Ireland. And actually, Lady Wilde fits quite neatly into this category because she wrote for an English readership. And the other group, the, the Arrivist group, were the cultural revivalists. They started to arrive later. They were young, more hot-headed um, men and women. They arrived during the 1880s and 1890s. And they had a great passion for a cultural revival, an Irish cultural revival. And it was actually this group that established the very Irish oriented organisations, such as the Southwark Literary Club, the Irish Literary Society, the Collegiate and the London Gaelic League. And they were quite suspicious of the first group, who they regarded as having diluted their Irish identity. These new arrivals were cultural nationalists. They were keen to explore and assert their separate Irish cultural identity. And many of the writers, prominent among them, W.B. Yeats, would in time return to Ireland and help bring about a Gaelic revival in Ireland. And it's interesting that Richard Pine, among other academics, considers Oscar Wilde to have fit into neither camp. He was an outsider, yet again, of both the Irish and English culture, and he didn't neatly fit into either of these categories. He sort of straddled both and made use of both, I think, as it suited him. Um, so if we move on then to the next slide, to look at, at some of those organisations specifically. And the first of these is the Southwark Irish Literary Club, um, which was established, it was um, a junior club set up in 1881, and then an Irish Literary Club in 1883, which was founded with Francis Fahey as its president. And then that led on ultimately in 1892 to the foundation of the Irish Literary Society which exists to this day and which very much has its roots in this Southwark Irish Literary Club. Um, Fahey, this man Francis Fahey, was a guiding light in that first wave of Irish cultural revivalism in London. And he described London, again in similar language as we've seen from others, as the world city of my reading and my dreams. Great affection and great admiration for the city of London. Um, Yeats left us a really colourful description of the Southwark Irish Literary Club. And he says, quote, there was a little Irish society of young people, clerks, shop boys and shop girls called the Southwark Irish Literary Society. And it had ceased to meet because the girls got the giggles when any member of the committee got up to speak. Every member of it had said all he had to say many times over. I had given them a lecture about the falling asunder of the human mind as an opening flower falls asunder. And all had professed admiration because I'd made such a long speech without quotation or, or narrative. So quite a <laughs> damning people. Um, quote there from Yates, who was uh, quite um, arrogant sometimes. Um, now, Fahey, this man Fahey, who was very powerful in the literary scene, mentions Wilde um, specifically, and he talks about Justin McCarthy's lecture on the literature of 48, that's that revolutionary year in Ireland, 1848. Um, most memorable of all was Justin McCarthy's lecture on the literature of 48, not alone for the personality of the lecturer and the charm and grace of his delivery, as for the fact that the chair was occupied by a man who had made history in that very period of 48, and had risen abroad to an eminence denied to him in his own land, to which he had now come back after 40 years, and who was still, at the age of 71, full of hope and love for Ireland, and as young as the youngest of us in eagerness to work for her redemption, Sir Charles Gavin Duffy. But Charles Gavin Duffy was very closely associated with Lady Wilde, had been her editor at The Nation, and they had a very strong friendship. Among the audience that night was a stout, clean-shaven man of about 33, dressed exquisitely who, in seconding the vote of thanks to the lecturer, praised the work of the club and promised a copy of his mother, Lady Wilde's Legends of Ireland, to the library. Oscar Wilde was then at the height of his fame, and I need not say with what curiosity we looked at and listened to him, happily ignorant of the terrible destiny hidden for him in the future, 
So really fascinating little glimpse there of Oscar, of what he was like when he was um, at that age of, of 33 and how he presented himself, of how closely connected he was with those old revered revolutionaries of Ireland like Charles Gavin Duffy through his mother. Really interesting insight there from, from Frank Fahey. Um, Wilde's presence, and I think we're actually, no, that's, we're fine in the slide, sorry. Wilde's presence at the Southern Irish Literary Club was greeted with some scepticism by some of the members because he was this outsider and he was very flamboyant and very aesthetic. But W.P. Ryan observed the Irish Literary Revival, in which he wrote in 1894, some members of the club saw irony in this as they viewed Wilde as the representative of a movement with which young Ireland could have no sympathy very head centre of aestheticism himself. More, cur more curious still, the same representatives should be the son of Speranza. So they were completely thrown by him because they had such reverence for his mother. They understood her as a revolutionary, as a revolutionary poet. And here was this dandified man, this aesthetic man. But at the same time, they had to grant him respect um, because of who he was uh, as Speranza's son and also because of his literary standing at the time. Um, if we move on to the next slide, um, another very prominent literary organisation with a very strong Irish influence and a high Irish participation um, was the Rhymers Club. And Wilde engaged with this club as well, although again, only periphery very often and, and quite um, an outsider. This club was active from 1890 to 1895. And the poet Arthur Lynch described the members as a small assemblage of poetical, pious young men. Members met to read aloud and criticise each other's works, and early meetings took place at 20 Fitzroy Street, which was where Lionel Johnson, uh, who the man who introduced Wilde to Lord Alfred Douglas, in fact, lived. He lived at that address. And Wilde attended the first meeting there, but he stopped attending when the Rhymers took to meeting monthly at the old Cheshire Cheese, which still exists, a very prominent pub on Fleet Street. And when the members went there, they drank beer and they smoked long clay church warden pipes. But Yates put it in four years, Quote, if we met in a private house, which we did occasionally, Oscar Wilde came. It had been useless to invite him to the Cheshire Cheese, for he hated Bohemia. So it may have been his dread of the pub that prevented him from attending more meetings, but he certainly only went sporadically and mostly seemed to attend in private houses. And in an interesting letter that Herbert Home wrote in 1890 to Ernest Rees, uh, he said, I asked the rhymers here the other evening. Oscar came at the end after the rhymes roll over and smiled like a Nero Neronian Apollo upon us all. A kind of enthusiasm or inspiration followed. So he's just dipping in, making his presence felt, but not necessarily staying around for all the boring poems that were being read out by, by the worthy members. So moving on then, um, to the, the most prominent and the most long lasting of these organizations, the Irish Literary Society, which still exists to this day. And really the key to the foundation of the society was Yeats because he felt that he needed something more, something more than just the Rhymers Club. And um, this Irish Literary Society was built on the circle of Irish writers who were very closely connected with a magazine called uh, Tinsley's Magazine. And the editor of that magazine was a man called Edmund Downey. And he was part of a partnership called Ward and Downey, and they were the publishers of Lady Wilde's books. So again, a close association there with the Wilde family. Wilde was a charter member of the organisation, as were both his mother and his brother. And again, to quote this man, W.P. Ryan, quote, when it was suggested that Oscar Wilde should be invited to join the society, one who knew him said that he would certainly put off the matter with a quip or a paradox, which, however, would be a good one and worthy of being entered in the minute book. This friend was a false prophet, for Oscar Fingal of Flaherty Wills Wilde was soon an honoured name on our register. His brother, William Wilde, an old contributor to Cotabus, came also. So Wilde had his supporters in the society, of course, and, and I've just divided the, the two camps there into supporters and detractors. And there's a quote there from Stephen Lucius Gwynn, who was secretary of the society and again a member of the Irish Parliamentary Party, so politics and literature crossing over once again. And this man declared, quote, there is no doubt at all about the gifts from Oscar Wilde. But he had his detractors as well. Because according to Yates, um, Downey, very prominent in the society, was the only man of Irish letters who turned down Yates's request for a letter of support to be addressed to, to Wilde at the time of his trials in 1895. And Yates regarded, um, sorry, uh, Dowden's grounds for refusal and the grounds were that he didn't care for Wilde's writing as completely spurious. And another detractor was this man that we've mentioned previously in connection with the Rhymers, and that was Arthur Lynch. And his extreme dislike for Wilde prompted the following 
um, quote from John Yates in a letter to his daughter, Lily, which he wrote in June 1994. And he writes, Lynch has retired from the Irish Literary Society founded here in London by Willie and Rollerson because he, Lynch, disapproves so much of Oscar Wilde. Willie and Lionel Johnson have condemned A. Lynch, who does not come up to their high standards, and now Lynch won't associate ever so remotely with Willie's great friend. So again, the distaste from, from several members um, of the organisation who didn't want to be associated with Oscar. So moving on then to the next slide. If we look specifically at the relationship between Wilde and Yeats, because it was a very interesting relationship. Um, when Yeats arrived in London as a very ambitious young writer, he was quite shy and he was quite keen to break in, but, but unsure as to how to do so. And his first route into London society, in fact, was um, through the salons that were held by Speranza, by Oscar's mother. He was invited along and she called him her Irish poet and he was made very welcome there and very well looked after. Um, and he found Oscar to be a kind and a very encouraging role model. And he expressed himself to be quite astonished by the brilliancy of his talk. They met in London in 1888 and they developed what could only be described as a friendship. I mean, they, they were quite close because Yeats even spent Christmas Day in 1888 with the Wild family. Although later in retrospect, he did write that he found something quote, too perfect about the setup that he saw there. Um, he talks about Wilde's attitude towards Irish people. Um, in his book, Four Years, he writes that he recalled Wilde saying to him of the Irish, quote, we are a nation of brilliant failures, but we are the greatest talkers since the Greeks. And he recognised <laughs> Wilde as a radical critic of English society. And that chimed very much with Yeats's own cultural nationalism and his own um, pursuit of, of the elevation of um, Irish folklore and, and Irish customs and Irish dress and Irish language. Um, when Yeats reviewed Arthur Savile's crime and other stories, he described Wilde's works as being, quote, an extravagant Celtic crusade against Anglo-Saxon stupidity, which was, uh, I'm not sure that Wilde would have described them as that, but that's certainly what Yeats saw. And when he wrote United Ireland in 1891, he wrote, Beer, Bible and the Seven Deadly Virtues have made England what she is, wrote Mr. Wilde once, and a part of the nemesis that has fallen upon her is a complete inability to understand anything he says. We should not find him so unintelligible, for much about him is Irish of the Irish. And in Wilde's time of greatest need, Yeats did actually come to his aid, and he supported him very publicly. He collected letters of support, as we've mentioned, from other fellow Irish writers. And in his memoirs, he disclosed that his own father, John B. Yeats, had encouraged him to see if he could, quote, be of any help, adding, quote, he was very kind to you. Perhaps he may wish to call you as a witness or something or other. So great support there when, when there was a, a lack of support um, in other parts of the community. If we move on to another very prominent Irish writer in the next slide, and that's, of course, George Bernard Shaw, another contemporary. It's amazing how many extraordinary talents and geniuses were mm -hmm. moving around in the same circles in such a small part of London at the time. Um, Shaw was very prominent in London at the time as well. And in fact, himself and Wilde together were recognised as the first Irish playwrights in decades to make any impact on the London stage. And they each admired um, one and the other and they were influenced by each other too. Um, they, it's so strange to think how close they were in youth as well, because they were born within two years and 20 minutes walk of each other. Um, and then in London, they lived so close together and moved in the same circles as well. Um, Wilde once wrote in a letter to Shaw, we are both Celtic and I like to think that we are friends. And he alone in literary London signed Shaw's petition in support of Irish American anarchists involved in Chicago's Haymarket riots. And afterwards, Shaw wrote of this act, it was a completely disinterested act on his part, and it secured my distinguished consideration for him for the rest of his life. But it has to be said that they may have been proximate in where they lived, and they were similar in terms of writing verses of the plays, but they were wildly different in temperament and inclination, wildly different in their politics, and their friendship was, if anything, if it could even be described as a friendship, it was a very uneasy friendship. They met mostly by chance. Um, and again, Shaw would have first met Wilde at one of his mother's gatherings, one of, of Lady Wilde's gatherings. Um, and he described how Wilde greeted him uh, on that occasion. Um, Shaw was a very young man, again, starting out in London, trying to make a career for himself. And he said that Oscar came and spoke to me with the inevident intention of being specially kind to me. We put each other out frightfully, and this odd difficulty persisted between us to the very last, even when we were no longer mere boyish novices and become men of the world with plenty of skill and social intercourse. I saw him very seldom, 
And in fact, he recalled just maybe between six and, and a dozen times from first to last. And I avoided literary and artistic coteries like the plague. So very different circles. Um, Shaw was to become very involved with the Fabians, of course, and with them. Um, uh, socialist politics um, and would have moved in in different circles politically. After a while he was imprisoned, Shaw too came to his aid and um, he drafted a petition for his release uh, which he was to send to the Home Secretary and he discussed its circulation with Willie Wilde but he was very disheartened by the lack of support and he concluded that since only himself and Reverend Stuart Hedlund had signed it that it would actually do no good, in fact it might do some harm. And he said, quote, as we were two notorious cranks and our names alone would make the thing ridiculous and do Oscar more harm than good, he decided not to submit it in the end. So if we move on then um, to look at the, the last of the Irish men, the prominent Irish men in London who had an association uh, with Oscar Wilde at this time, one less supportive and one quite a close um, friend at the time. So very much less supportive was the influential Irish novelist, short story, writer, poet, art critic and memorist and dramatist George Moore. And he moved to London in 1869. So again, in that wave of writers that were moving over uh, to the city. He interestingly had a connection, a childhood connection with the Wells as well, because he grew up in the west of Ireland and he became very friendly with young Willie and Oscar when they were spending their summer holidays at nearby by Moichora. Um, where their father had a hunting lodge. But he refused point blank to acknowledge Wilde as an artist. And in a letter to Frank Harris, um, who was a colorful and opportunistic um, Irish newspaper editor, I'm sure you're all very familiar with him, and who knew Wilde well, um, Moore wrote at length about his low regard for Wilde as a writer. Um, and I've just highlighted in red from that letter some of the quotes. Um, so he's been specifically asked by Harris to give his opinion of Wilde. And he says, I'm sorry to have to tell you that my opinion will not gel with your opinion because you would put him in the first class of writer and I would put him in the third or fourth. Um, he talks about intentions being very thin and casual without depth unoriginal, very rarely you hear that said about uh, Wilde's writing. He talks about Oscar Wilde's talent seeming essentially ruthless, something growing in a glass with little water, struck by his lack of style, and by style he means rhythm. Um, but then I think he reveals something about his true attitude later on in the letter when he talks about Wilde's abnormal impulses, marking him out as an interesting subject for literary study. So how genuine was he in his condemnation of his literary um, achievements and how did he just find the man distasteful um, to his own personal, whatever kind of morality he had. Um, so he, he refused point blank to, to really give any kind of good account of him. Um, Harris, uh, on the other hand, very colourful, very opportunistic. He knew Wilde very well. He wrote a book, which we're all familiar with, called Oscar Wilde, His Life and Confessions. Um, Wilde found Harris brash and combative, but they did maintain this association for many years. And it was actually George Bernard Shaw who gives this account of Harris trying to talk Wilde out of proceeding with the libel trial. Um, I have a quote there. Um, from George Bernard Shaw, while it was a curious double temper, he made no pretense either of innocence or of questioning the folly of proceedings against Queensbury. Um, and he had an infatuated haughtiness as to the impossibility of his retreating and his right to dictate um, your course. Douglas sat in silence, a haughty and dignant silence, copying Wilde's attitude as with all Wilde's admirers, but quite probably influencing Wilde as he suggests by the copy. And then he talks about how Oscar finally rose to the mixture of impatience and his grand air and walked out with the remark that he had now found out who his real friends were. And Douglas followed him, and I think this is a lovely quote, absurdly smaller and imitating his walk like a curate following an archbishop. So Joel was great for his, uh, his cutting, biting comments and observations. Mm. So, we've talked a lot about the men, the Irish men that Wilde associated um, with, but the most prominent among them, really, I suppose, the one that had the biggest influence on his life was the next man that we're going to look at in the next slide, and that is, of course, Edward Carson. And again, as with Shaw, you can see how closely intertwined their lives were. They were both born in 1854. They both grew up in upper middle class Dublin, um, while grew up in Marion Square. And Carson grew up in very nearby Harcourt Street. If anybody's familiar with Dublin, it's just a couple of minutes walk away. There's evidence that they played together as tiny children, as five-year-olds on the beach in Dungarvan. They were students at Trinity College around the same time. They're said to have been friendly there. But again, they were very different in nature and in temperament. 
Um, while done learning that Ned, as he called him Carson, was defending Queensbury, said, no doubt he will perform his task with all the added bitterness of an old friend. But yes, there was a certain sympathy there, it seems, too. Um, Carson was a very ambitious man and he was going to do what was required of him. But after the trial, he's reported to have said to his wife, I have ruined the most brilliant man in London. And in fact, Merlin Holland notes that Carson is believed to have interceded on Wilde's behalf ahead of his second criminal trial um, and said to the Solicitor General, can you not let up on the fellow now who suffered a great deal? So he saw that things had gone too far. Um, again, like some of the other men we've looked at, he never accepted Wilde's literary geni genius and described him in fact as a charlatan. So if we, uh, and, and just as a footnote to say that obviously Carson played a huge role um, in partition in Ireland and is probably very famous here for very different things than his association with Oscar Wilde. So I always find it interesting that uh, he's a very different man in later life to us here um, and we'd be very familiar with his life and the role he played. So uh, a long career and a very varied one. And um, if we move on then. Um, I've, I've talked a lot about men, but I want to talk about some of the women, the Irish women that were involved uh, with Wilde in London, just a, a few examples. Um, and one of the most colourful and prominent of these was Lady Colin Campbell. And she was born in Dublin as well. She was born in Dublin in 1857. She was born Gertrude Elizabeth Blood. She was intelligent, she was cultured, and she was a very beautiful woman. Um, she came to prominence really because she had a very turbulent marriage. Uh, to Lord Colin Campbell and it failed and she obtained a separation on the grounds of cruelty and then they had a very very public divorce case in 1886 of sordid accusations of adultery thrown around and made her into a household name really for all the wrong reasons um, she worked as a journalist She's famous for having described Wilde as he quoted alternatively either the Great White Slug or the Great White Caterpillar, so she clearly had very low opinion of him. And she worked as a journalist, and Wilde wrote very mockingly about her um, when he said, How bad the Grosvenor paragraph is. I could have done you a column on it, and it should be done well. But what does Lady Colin mean by the shirtless sisterhood? Even town talk would hardly use such an expression. I see she requires very careful supervision if she is to continue to write, particularly as people says. Um, seem to know that she does so. I am told that Pollock is so enraged at her saying in court that she wrote in the Saturday that he won't have anything to do with her. I think you could get the work better done by others. And the puff of Madame Isabel is too obvious and provincial. So he's really trying to undermine her. In fact, he's trying to have her fired from her job, which is, is um, pretty mean, really. Uh, he famously was seated beside her at a Society of Authors dinner in July 1888. And he complained and accused the organiser of gross mismanagement. And very cuttingly, after reading her novel, Daryl Blake, he concluded that she had, quote, exhausted all her powers of imagination in the witness box. So he really didn't like her and she really didn't <laughs> like her. <laughs> um, if we move on then to another woman who again expressed some fairly um, low opinions of Wilde, and that's Edith Somerville. And she was the Irish writer and illustrator who is most closely associated with the Irish RM. Um, which was televised, I considered quite relatively recently mm -hmm. because of my books, but um, certainly uh, very long lasting. And she visited Oscar once in the offices of the Women's World when he was editing the magazine. And she gives an account of this visit in a letter that she wrote to her cousin and collaborator, Violet Martin. Now, I'm sure that poor Edith Somerville never intended us to be sitting here reading her letter or anybody else for that matter. So she wrote very frankly, and she said, Hey, and I went down to Oscar yesterday sent him a letter and were marched in. He is a great fat oily beast. Oh. <laughs> he pretended the most enormous, dreadful, I know. He pretended the most enormous interest. By Edgerton's advice, and that's George Edgerton, I said I was the Bart's niece, as Oscar knows him well. So again, playing on this kind of snobbery and connections, but it was to no avail. And so he didn't, um, he didn't want her work. He didn't take her work. And she was very, very put out by this and, and quite uh, cutting in what she, she said and wrote about him. So she, he didn't make a friend there, that's for sure. Um, if we move on then to a more obscure couple of women, both writers as well, um, but women who knew him again in Dublin. Um, and they played tennis with him, in fact. They played tennis with Oscar and with Willie. Uh, tennis was a very new sport by then, and both brothers played it, and they played with these sisters. Um, Julia Davis was a friend of Ada Leverson's, uh, and her sister was a fashion columnist called Eliza Davis Aria. And in My Sentimental Self, Eliza describes Oscar playing tennis, and she describes him as in a high hat, and his frock coat tails flying, and his long hair waving in the breeze. Oops, sorry. Sorry. 
message to say I should be finishing up kind of early on. <laughs> um, so their connection didn't end there with that early encounter on the tennis courts. When Eliza became involved in a long-term affair with Henry Irving, she suggested, unfortunately to no avail, that Irving should stage the Duchess of Padua, which would have been doing well a huge favour had that happened. And in 1906, Julia, writing as Frank Danby, published a book called The Sphinx's Lawyer, which Eliza described as an attempt to, quote, defend the undefendable Oscar Wilde. Mm -hmm. Um, so Julia, in an astonishing preface in the book addressed to her brother Owen Hall, declared, because you hate and loathe my book and its subject, I dedicate it to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Oscar appears in this book, um, he puts in an appearance in the guise of Algernon Heseltine, a man treated unjustly by society because he was not as others on account of his genius. Um, the applause changed to low suspicious muttering after his fall, she observed. And although she seems very sympathetic towards Oscar when she writes things like that and she loves his genius and she describes him as a martyr, it's certainly not a vindication because she suggested that this Hesseldown character was mad and that he should have been placed in safety and kept from spreading his disease from working evil. So um, not the kind of defender you'd necessarily want in your corner, to be honest. <laughs> and then to move on to my very last slide and the very last woman I'm going to look at, and she's a woman that none of us know and will never know and we'll never know her name. But I think this little tale gives some insight into how kind Oscar Wilde could be. And how he wasn't always looking to what somebody could do for him or what kind of advantage he could gain by being nice or helpful to, to society, women or to, or to powerful political men. Um, his life was full of glamorous women, but he was an egalitarian at heart. Um, and he was described as having an irrepressible inward gaiety. And um, Charles Ricketts talked about how kindliness and the desire to please gave charm to his face. And there's a very um, touching story told by his friend, Reynold Rod, a wonderful story, which begins when there was flooding in the district of Lambert, the very poor uh, down at Hill district in London at the time. There was an uncommonly high tide and disastrous flooding. And Oscar um, and he turned up to offer their assistance, just very practical assistance. And Oscar spent several hours in the miserable tenement home of an old bedridden Irish woman, quote, cheering her with his merry humour and assisting her with little necessities for which, as he said, she had more than compensated him by praying that the Lord would give him a bed in glory. So lovely touching with the woman. It gives a real insight into how kind and how nice he was. And, and it was nice that she was an Irish woman too, a, a compatriot of his. And that's really my crystal stop tour of, of Wilde in London and how he fit into the scene there, but literary and political and, and the, the <laughs> newspaper man and, and all the rest of it. Quite a lot to take in. So I'm very happy if you have any questions or comments to make and to take them at this point.